Welcome to the Money Answer Show with host Jordan Goodman. Whether you are starting out, deep into your retirement, or somewhere in between, the Money Answer Show has the know-how to help you. Now here's your host, Jordan Goodman. Welcome to the Money Answer Show. This is Jordan Goodman, your host. My guest this hour is R.C. Peck. He is the founder of Fearless Wealth at fearlesswealth.com. You'll hear more, more about his entire approach to investing. Welcome to the Money Answer Show, R.C. Great to be here. So you have an interesting background in how you created Fearless Wealth. Just give us a brief uh, introduction to your background and how you led to this. Yeah, it is It is kind of odd. Uh, so uh, I'm a dyslexic, so I have dyslexia. It was uh, not diagnosed. I didn't know it until probably my 30s. Uh, but the way I come at investing is visually, right? I, I train people and teach people to be able to see what's going on. And because as a kid, it was very hard for me to read, uh, still is today. Um, you know, I only learned afterwards that our brains are really designed to see patterns. But a big part of my background is my dyslexia and how I'm able to train other people to turn on those pattern recognition parts of their brain. Um, also, too, which I know you know, my parents had their life savings embezzled when I was a teenager. And so that kind of, uh, <laughs> it, it made me be a skeptic very early on. Yes, indeed. Yes. Uh, well, part of what you do is NLP, Neuro Linguistic Programming. That's what it stands for, right? That's right. So just maybe for people who aren't familiar, tell us a little bit about NLP and then how you use that to apply to investing behavior. Yes. Yeah, so the easiest way to define NLP is it's the software of the brain, right? So every computer needs software and hardware. Uh, the software language of the brain is this NLP, neuro for the brain, linguistic words, programming. Words program our brains. So if something's not working in an area of your life, there's probably something with the programming around it. So my specialty and focus is having people kind of get control back over their finances and money. And what I often want to know is what words, what investment words, like how does their brain respond to them? And most people's brains are not designed to respond in a stable, consistent uh, manner. You can think of the two big uh, motivating forces being fear and greed when you come to investing. So how do you help people retrain their mind so that they're not captive to either fear or greed? You know, before someone ever has fear or greed, they had to hear something, right? They either said it to themselves, someone said it to them, they heard it, they read it, they saw it. But some that information gets put into words and then the words create a feeling, whether it's feeling greedy or feeling fearful, right? So um, most words we're taught to understand and learn the brain has to figure out what to do. Like the brain doesn't know what risk means. Uh, the brain has to take the word dividend and go, well, I guess that means I'll be safe. So I guess I should buy something with a dividend because that means safe. So the brain has to do all of this translating of words to meanings and feelings to try to find a shortcut to go, okay, I want to feel safe. Uh, dividend, I think, is safe. And so that's just one example of where the brain could easily get hijacked, right, of buying something with the word dividend in it, which may not actually be good for that person's money. Yeah. So how do you retrain people? You have an online series of courses at fearlesswealth.com. How do you retrain people's minds using NLP so that they're better investors? Great. So I'll just I'll give you one example. Um, the words we use really determine the the worlds we live in. So a, a really simple example is if someone says, "I'm just so busy. I'm just so busy." Um, now, busy can be in any area of your life, right? It doesn't have to just do with finances. But in my training, what I say is, you're not allowed to use the word busy because the brain doesn't know busy. And so all I do is have them replace it with the word scared. Right. So if they say to me, I'm just so busy, I can't do the work. or I'm so busy, I can't check my account. Well, that's actually not true. What's really true is they're feeling scared about something, scared to talk to their wife or their spouse or their husband or their boss or someone to have or take a certain action. 
So if you replace this vague, ambiguous word like busy and you replace it with a feeling word, which I know I probably just lost half of your audience, by the way, by doing this. Okay. Um, but what happens is if you have a grown person say, I'm scared to check my portfolio. Okay, well, now the brain actually knows what's going on. Great. This person is scared to log into a website. Okay, now I'm not saying it that way to shame them, but it's like at least we're starting to get down to what the problem is because people are not busy and they never have been. So the part of the idea is to kind of confront them with reality that they use other words to kind of mask, I guess you might say. Is that right? Well, yeah. I mean, if you, I mean, force, that's, that's not really what happens. They, <laughs> they're willingly coming in and wanting control back over their, their money and their life. But if you just offer these small changes, and this is just a small example. So if a grown man of 55 then says, RC, I was, I was just, I was scared and I didn't do my homework. Okay. Now I at least can have a conversation with that person about what's really going on. Right. Whereas if he said to me, oh, it's, just, it's been a busy week, that's a cop out. That, that's yeah. actually, that's not true. That's not true. We've got, you know, a lot of hours and a lot of those hours were spent in front of Netflix. So we know, again, I'm not shaming this example, but we know it's never about time. Yeah. So you talk, you say you're about a financial clarity and ruthless simplicity, as you call it. Explain a little bit more about how using that clarity and simplicity would help make people better investors. Okay. So let's say you're 60 years old, you're, you want to retire, or you're going to retire soon, or you are retired. And one of the things all humans do is they want to be safe, right? So when you had your career, you got income, and you got that stability, and you got that safety from your your income, but now you don't have your income anymore. So what happens is people will go look for some way to replace that stability, that safety. And I'm going to go back to dividends again. So what they'll do is they'll say, well, I have to get income and dividends are income. Okay. What happens is they buy something that gives them the income they want, but what they're not clear about because they've never been taught to open their eyes is the net net of that purchase or that investment is actually going to slow their growth down. And so what I do is I just show them, look, if you buy the 1% a month dividend ETF, and I can actually show them a price chart of it, I can show them and say, look, it's not even net of dividends and capital growth. It's not even outperforming the S&P 500. So look, if you buy something, regardless of the words, regardless of the ETF or the mutual fund or the product is called, if it cannot outperform what I call the free stock market rate of return, I think you're inviting in unnecessary price volatility and loss into your life. Okay, that makes sense. Let's go through the, the course. You have two parts of your fearlesswealth.com website. One is research and the other one is training. Let's talk about the training a little bit. So you have a six part, six modules, and let's just briefly go through what people get uh, for doing. The first one is the start module. What happens in that one? So I want to start where I think is the biggest problem everyone has, and that's decision fatigue. Right. The, the conscious brain can only handle seven things at once, plus or minus. Okay. And so what happens is someone, someone comes into anything, whether it's looking at their 401k or deciding what to eat. And if your brain is completely overloaded and you're in decision fatigue, you're going to make bad choices. I don't care what your IQ is, how good looking you are, the square footage of your house. People with decision fatigue make bad choices. So I start the entire course off with going, look, we've got to figure out a way to make sure that you build a filter so 99% of the noise gets filtered out. And, looks, and look what happens when that doesn't happen through just common things. And so that's one of the first things I do is have them kind of look at what decision fatigue can do. Okay, so what, what are the 99% that's filtered out and what's the 1% that they should be paying attention to? I think all that matters is do you own something with the price going higher? Forget the name of it for a second, set that aside. But if you own XYZ or ABC or one, two, three, 
is it in a stable uptrend? Is it going up and to the right? And so the the 1% in this case is the price of what you own has to be going higher. I don't care if it's a stock or a bond or a dividend or whatever. The first filter is, can this make, make me more stable? Well, what happens if something goes up, like we've had a bull market for basically 10 plus years, and all of a sudden it reverses and starts going down? Do you have some kind of a trigger mechanism or stop loss, or how do you protect them when the trend reverses? Yeah, uh, of course. So, you know, 78% of the time, the stock market's in a, what I call a green light mode, up and to the right, and 22% of the time, it's in a, you know, <laughs> oh my God, how am I going to get out of this? My, I hope my account doesn't get cut in half again. And so one of the things I train is, A, to know when that's happening, right? Because people, people aren't trained to know the difference between a crash and a correction. They just assume, because again, they've never been taught to turn towards the market with their eyes open, they have to assume every small correction is a crash, so I first train them to know the difference, and then I train them to, to know that if, in fact, it is going to be what looks like a crash, they know the steps to, to get out of the market, to get out of the positions that are hurting them. So what happened this year when we did have a crash? Yeah, so um, what happened this year is my clients were trained to start stepping out of the market in a methodical way, right? So... X is happening. So if X happens, then do Y. And so what happened is they started stepping out of the market. So there are certain like stop loss levels, percentage losses, or just explain exactly how, I mean, the market peaked in February, basically. And yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the market peaked February 19th, uh, at least in the United States. And so the, the stop loss, it's, it's, there's four steps to get out and there's four steps to get back in. And so each step, it's a combination of price and time. Uh, so, you know, if you look at every market correction over any time period, the majority of them are all sub 20%. Again, yeah. I'm looking at the S and P 500. So any sort of index on the S and P that's sub 20% is going to create an incredible amount of noise. All right, well, let's take a break. Uh, this is Jordan Goodman of The Money Answer Show. My guest this hour is R.C. Peck. He is the founder of Fearless Wealth. You can find out more about him at fearlesswealth.com. We'll be back after this. You've been listening to The Money Answer Show with Jordan Goodman. If you have a question for Jordan or his guest, please call us now at 866-472-5790. That's 866-472-5790. Now back to Jordan. Welcome back to The Money Answer Show. This is Jordan Goodman, your host. My guest this hour is R.C. Peck. He is the founder of FearlessWealth.com. Uh, he specializes in neuro-linguistic programming and how that helps people become better investors. Welcome back to the show, RC. Good to be here. So we started off with the opening module. The second module is what you call the wealth dashboard for growth. What's involved with that? Look, people are taught to disconnect from their money, right? And even if someone uses a website where they can aggregate the information, there's a lot of disconnecting. So I built the wealth dashboard about two decades ago. So someone could easily connect with their money and know exactly if you know exactly if they're going to be okay or if they are okay. So it's a way to interact with your net wealth, right? Your income and your savings and your liquid assets and your illiquid assets and your debt, but to put it all into a number that you can look at and go, "Am I okay?" Is this number getting bigger? Is this number getting smaller? If it's getting smaller, I know exactly what part of my wealth to look at. So there's no friction. There's no decision fatigue in looking at your own wealth dashboard. Um, and look, when someone has clarity about how they're doing and their spouse comes to them, you know, the husband comes to the wife and says, I want to go buy a car, or the wife says to the husband, I want to buy a car. Instead of them debating back and forth, they can literally take this tool and go, all right, so it sounds like you want a car. Let's look at our money and let's see where we can get the money or what that looks like, right? So it's not them against each other. It's saying, okay, well, let's look at our wealth dashboard and see how we pay for that car. 
So is the data automatically flowing in there from your investment accounts, and your bank accounts, and your credit cards? How does the data get into the dashboard? Yeah, so there's two ways. Um, it's really important that every month people spend about 10 minutes actually connecting with their money. And there's only one way you can really connect with money that's better than anything else. And that's actually typing in your account balances. And uh, sometimes I get the eye rolls or, oh, this is silly. I'm not going to be typing in my account balances. But it has, it has never not worked where someone's like, you know what? 10 minutes a month typing in account balances makes me connect to how I am doing. It's, it's, that, it's that way to connect and go, oh, wait a second. Oh, yeah, I'm okay. Because they're actually doing it, right? They're not just automatically logging into like a mint.com. Now, you yep. can have a mint.com or a personal finance or any, any sort of you know, software aggregator, but to, to type the numbers in, and again, everyone's got 10 minutes, so this isn't about time or effort. It's about I'm scared to do it or not. Um, but when someone does that, and just so you know, the people that I'm talking about doing this, these are professionals, right, who make six figures, who have marriages and have families and have, you know, friendships. And once they make it a habit of typing those numbers in each month or maybe even each quarter, the level of calmness in their life of like, no, I'm good. I know exactly what's going on. Right. So if their spouse does come to them or if their kid comes to them or whomever and they say, I want a then go, oh, well, if we did that, it'd have to come from this account. Let's just go look at it. But they're not defending anymore. They're they're fielding questions and not defending. Yeah. Much more powerful there. The third section is what you call market strategies. So how do you explain market strategies? Yes. Yeah, so this is I mean, every module is the magic, but people seem to love this because this is where I show them how to open their eyes and look at what they own and to set aside the words of what they own, right? Again, I'm going to keep coming back. I've, but by the way, <laughs> I have no problem with dividends, but that thing darn well better be outperforming the $20 trillion company called USA Inc. Um, so once I show them how to turn their eyes on and use their pattern recognition brain, the amount of certainty and, and oh my gosh, I'll be okay, the amount of control that comes back into their life because no one's ever trained them to see their investments, right? And I don't mean that 15-page thing you get from your big box advisor that is confusing as all get out. Yeah. I mean a simple picture that you can look at and go, oh, I'm okay. And that module trains their brain to literally be like, oh, is that going to make me more stable or is it going to make me more unstable? And you can get to a point where it's really binary, where it's like, yes, it is or it isn't. And if it's not, you can do something to get more clarity. And the brain loves it. I mean, the brain loves seeing things. That's why it takes words and makes pictures out of them. Yeah. The next section is what you call right mind, right action. Uh, so what's happened to that module? Yeah, so this is, the, <laughs> this is the module where uh, if there's any sort of allergy that you have to thinking a little weird or a little woo-woo or a little magical, um, most people recreate their childhood trauma and drama within their finances. Um, and so this is a module that shows what belief system do you have in order to get the experience you're having with your money, right? What are some things you can tune into or some questions you can ask to start to um, position your emotions, place, I call, I call it placing your emotions um, because just because the emotion is happening in your body doesn't mean it's yours, which I know sounds really weird, um, but this is the module that really has them start to ask these deeper questions like, why, why do I recreate instability? How much or, child, childhood recreation effect? Absolutely, absolutely. Which to a lot of people, that sounds very weird. Then the fifth module is a checklist for proper action. What are some of the things on the checklist? Well, first of all, um, every great surgeon has a checklist. Um, if you want to grow your wealth, you better have a checklist to do it in the right order every time. 
Um, so the checklist is a way of taking kind of where you are today and saying, if this is happening, then do this, right? So you, you need a checklist when things are going sideways. And so the checklist keeps you honest, right? It makes sure you act the way you're supposed to behave when you're supposed to behave that way. Um, so one thing in answering your question, one thing on the checklist is start with a picture. Start with a picture. If someone scares you because of a, a tweet or you know, a comment or a headline, the first thing on the checklist is go look at a picture of this. Oh. Because, because that picture will reframe that person's brain to go, oh, got it. That was a tweet. Not so what portfolio. happens if the, the, the stock market starts falling, crashing? What pictures should they see when that's happening so that they do the right action? Well, they'll, see, they'll actually see the stock market accelerating past a correction and into a crash, right? So they'll visually see it, and on their super straightforward checklist, they'll be like, okay, if it does this, then this is your next step. So it gives very specific uh, you know, black and white steps on how to start stepping out of the stock market. So selling a p- portion of your portfolio at certain price levels is what you're it, saying. It, exactly, exactly. Yeah. If this happens, then sell X percent. If this happens, sell X percent. And so it's a feedback loop every time. Yeah. Meaning, or, meaning, or yeah. Works well, yeah. Like, Thank or, you. Or, exactly. Or, or yeah, or, or buying. Yeah. And then there's sixth module is why people fail. Uh, so w- what are some of the behaviors that cause people to fail? So, you know, one of the behaviors is it's it's one thing to start a behavior. It's another to continue it. Um, and I guess the easiest way is with someone's health or with their weight. Um, you know, in, in many ways, it's easier to lose the weight than to keep it off. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so what happens sometimes is you start using something that works and it's working and you're like, right, this is working. And then it's working. And then you say, well, now that that's worked, I'm going to try something new. I'm going to try something new now because what I'm doing is working. I mean, this is how the brain works, mm-hmm. right? Because we want something novel and new and shiny. And so what happens is people get their entire financial life in order to get control back over it. And one of the potential downfalls is, well, now that that worked, now let me try something new with my money. And that's okay. one of those behaviors where it can get you. They should keep doing the old thing that's working, as you're saying. Exactly, exactly. So it, there's a, a need for novelty, is that what you're saying, that kind of leads people astray? Humans have a deep desire <laughs> for something new. Okay, very good. All righty. And then you have a whole other department in Fearless Wealth, which is called research. What are some things that they'll see in research? Yeah, so research is kind of, I mean, training is where I teach them the fish. Research is where I, I give them fish. Uh, so one of the things they would see in research is a model portfolio. Um, and and they'd, they'd be able to see it, whether the market's in green light mode or red light mode. And if it's in green light mode, you know, where are the strongest parts of the market? And if it's in red light mode, where are the strongest parts of the market? And so it's this, it's a very kind of quick, high level, what mode is the market in and where is the stability? So there's always going to be something green and always going to be something red. Is that right? Money always goes to stability. So the answer is yes. Now, maybe the thing that's stable is cash. Mm Mm-hmm. Right, and yep. it might not be gold. Right, people are sold on the idea that it has to be something, and it doesn't. I can tell you from studying every stock market crash in this country going back 120 years, money has always flowed into, or investments have always flowed into cash when people get scared. It's the one consistent of every market crash. Yeah, so it's the preserving of your money as opposed to earning a return on it today that's important. Yeah, and, it, and, it, and first of all, it's a default, right? When you sell a position, whether it's a bond or a stock or a commodity, like the default is cash. Um, and and I actually train people to think of cash as an investment so they're never stuck, quote unquote, setting their money aside for nine years. Yeah. Right? Well, I'm not invested. My money set aside. It's like there, you, there's no such thing as setting your money aside. It's always invested at all times. Yeah, very good. Okay, we're going to take another break. This is Jordan Goodman of The Money Answer Show. 
My guest this hour is R.C. Peck. He is the founder of Fearless Wealth. You can find out more about his program we were just discussing at fearlesswealth.com. We'll be back after this. You've been listening to The Money Answer Show with Jordan Goodman. If you have a question for Jordan or his guest, please call us now at 866-472-5790. That's 866-472-5790. Now back to Jordan. Welcome back to The Money Answer Show. This is Jordan Goodman, your host. My guest this hour is R.C. Peck. He's the founder of FearlessWealth.com. He's an expert in neuro-linguistic programming and how that helps people become better investors. Welcome back to the show, R.C. Thanks. Let's talk about the current situation. Uh, what is green and uh, what is red? Is there a yellow? By the way, it's only green or red. Yeah, I mean, there actually, <laughs> there actually are because one of the things I train is you have to learn how to step out. And the, the human brain doesn't do stepping out. The human brain does either you're killed by the thing in the grass with big teeth or you survive. So the brain's designed to just in case run just in case run. So the way that shows up in investing is what happens is people go all in, all out. The problem is when you go all out, you have no idea how to get back in. So yes, there is a yellow and an orange. (laughs) Okay. So in general, what assets are green and what assets are uh, red these days? Cash is king right now. Um, This is true with every market turmoil going back at least in this country, you know, 150 years. If in doubt, keep it in cash. People stop looking for making 1% or making whatever. When things get unstable, when they are concerned about their future, people hold money in their local currency. Yeah. Um, and, and that's what's going on. What's interesting is most people will have been told that bonds are safe. Well, what's going on with this particular crisis that we're in, not all bonds behave the same. And so what people are seeing is their corporate investment grade bonds. So these are the safest corporate bonds are absolutely cracking or have cracked and they need the backing of the government. Um, And the government's actually said, okay, 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 we're going to have about the investment grade bond market. But I doubt the government's going to buy defaulted bonds in the investment grade world. So... In answering your question, investment grade bonds are in trouble. Municipal bonds are in trouble. The one type of bond that is not is U.S. Treasuries, right? Basically, the Fed's like, guys, we're going to defend our own bond. And so when you look at all the different types of bonds, inflation-protected bonds, municipal bonds, corporate bonds, junk bonds, treasury bonds, um, they're not all created equally. And it's actually been the treasury, the federal bonds, no one calls them federal bonds, but the treasuries, the 10 years plus, that have been the, the safest and the most stable. I mean, the irony of that is this is at a time when the federal government is dramatically improving, imploding <laughs> its deficits and, and spending $2 trillion here, and the Federal Reserve is expanding, expanding its balance sheet by trillions of dollars. Normally, you'd think that would be very inflationary and the worst possible thing for bonds. So how does that work? Yeah, so isn't this interesting? Literally, (laughs) the Fed cannot print money fast enough. Like back in 08, they're like, okay, we'll do a trillion here. We're going to do, you know, 85, 85 billion a month for like, they would kind of pace it out and be like, and then, you know, would be like, okay, okay, it's only going to be a trillion. And then Bernanke would do another trillion. And then Bernanke would do another trillion. Today, there's no numbers. It's just like, yep, it's open. We're open for what, whoever needs it. Whoever, we're going to just print, 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 print. And the market's okay with this. Isn't that and, the definition of inflation? Well, it depends. How do you define inflation, right? Because commodities are deflating, and commodities have been deflating since 2011. So corn is near the cheapest ever. So is sugar. So is coffee. So is oil. So are the grains. Like, so... From a Inflation commodity. is more, more money chasing fewer goods. So we have more money. We got too much good, too many goods right now. But it's not showing up because on the other side of that equation, you have Amazon, Walmart, China making all those goods cheaper. Yeah. Right. So you don't need to rent a 10,000 square foot office anymore. For $99 a year, you can have Zoom 
and conference call everyone in, right? As, as an example, right? So that's deflationary, yes. right? China producing cheaper stuff, Amazon producing cheaper stuff, you not having to fly on a plane across the country to go see someone, that is all deflationary. So yes, the Fed's printing and the technology, you know, the tech world and China, and by the way, it's not China versus US. Who do you think China's making all that stuff for? Us. Right. So t- this, this finger pointing is, is dangerous. Um, and so you have you know, technology in China on one side, <laughs> you know, or, or Amazon and Alibaba on one side, um, and on the other side, you have Fed printing. And guess what? Technology's winning. Yeah. So in the battle between deflation and inflation, deflation, the deflationary forces are so strong that despite pretty much unlimited printing of money, we're still, that's the stronger force. Absolutely. And just also think about it too. The richer a country gets, the more they save. This just has been going on hundreds of years, thousands of years. The richer a country, the more likelihood of deflation. Because what do the rich do? They save money. They right? The to- right? Yeah. The top 1% are not living beyond their means. The top 2% are not living beyond their means. They're saving and they're saving and they're saving and they're saving. They can only buy so many Model Xs or you know Model yep. Ss. Like they're going to get one, maybe two, but the richer a country gets, the more deflation um, takes hold. And I guess there's a demographic aspect of this as well because as the population gets older, it wants to save more and spend less. It doesn't need stuff. It's already got what it needs. Exactly. The kids are out or they're done with college. So that huge inflationary thing, really what they're left with, they, baby boomers, people over the age of, let's say 60, it's healthcare and it's only yeah. healthcare. And yeah. if they got Medicare or Medicaid, that's been tampered down. So again, if you have you know 78 million baby boomers, they're not out spending money on $10,000 Disney cruises. Right. I mean, maybe some of them are, but- that's a deflationary pressure. So if the overall trend is deflationary, despite unlimited Fed money printing and huge deficits on the federal government part, what does well in deflation and what does not do well in deflation? Maybe taking the 30s as an example. Well, yeah, I mean, what does well today? I mean, <laughs> up until February 19th, what did really well was the stock market. Um, but funny what happens when the entire country gets shut down and tens of millions of people are applying for unemployment, uh, people don't want to own the stocks of those things that no one is buying. So the, the, you know, the question becomes over what time period, right? The, the answer is over a longer time period, you have inflation in the stock market, right? That That's where money is going, right? Of course, there's pretty dramatic crashes that happen. Um, but I, money is not flowing into precious metals in a, well, it actually depends what country you're in. Yeah, gold's at, you're in. Yeah, yeah. I mean, gold's at lifetime highs in the British pound and the European euro. Um, because those currencies are coming down compared to the dollar. Exactly. So it depends what currency land you live in, whether you have lifetime highs in gold. Yeah. Um, so it, in general, it, it, does gold do well during deflation? Every deflationary period is different. Like the, the worst deflationary period ever, gold was illegal to own. <laughs> it was right. illegal to own it. Now, you could own silver. And so I can answer you by saying silver crushed it in the 30s. Uh-huh. Sil- silver beat everything in the night. Every, everything, RC, everything. If you owned ownership, publicly traded on you know, in a silver mine, you were king of your town. If you owned silver coins, they greatly appreciated. Silver now, that was, legal, yeah. now that it's legal to own gold, gold and silver should do well in this deflationary environment, you're saying? You know, should. Uh, <laughs> I can tell you what's going on right now, and that is – depending on what currency you buy, the precious metal, and it really determines whether you believe gold is a hedge or not, right? If you're in the UK or Europe, you're like, heck yeah, gold's doing its job again. 
if you get paid in U.S. dollars, you're scratching your head curious what's going on. Yeah. So the, the two big assets that you think should do well during deflation are cash and precious metals. Stocks would get hurt and bonds would get hurt, particularly those with higher risk levels. So even on the treasury level, do you think we could go to negative interest rates in the United States as, as happened in, in Europe and Japan and other places? I think it's 100% likely. I, I, I think we're going to see a, a 0% on the 10, and I, I think we're going to see it drop to a negative. Um, Japan is the third largest economy by size on the planet, and they, they are they're actually slightly positive maybe right now, but they've been negative for a while. Germany, which is the engine of Europe, Europe's the largest economic block on the planet. The German 10-year is yielding negative, is, is a negative yield already. So, so what is that telling you? What is a negative yield telling you what the market's, you say, listen to the market. What is the market saying when it has a negative yield on long-term treasuries? The demand for, I got to be safe. I just, I got to be safe, Jordan. I just, I got to be safe. I, I'll just, okay, look, I'll give you a hundred bucks, but give me back 99 and a half dollars. So it's telling us the demand for safety is just, you know, is bullish, right? Who, who buys a negative yielding 10 year? The answer is someone who's super scared and got, they've just got to make sure the money is there when they get back, right? Yeah. No one buys it for investment purposes so they can buy the speedboat. They're Correct. doing it because they are scared. So it's as about the pres- preservation of assets, it's a, a classic safety haven. Absolutely. You get no return at all. Yes. Absolutely. Very good. We're going to take another break. This is Jordan Goodman of The Money Answer Show. My guest this hour is R.C. Peck. He is the founder of Fearless Wealth. You can find out more about him at fearlesswealth.com. We'll be back after this. You've been listening to The Money Answer Show with Jordan Goodman. If you have a question for Jordan or his guest, please call us now at 866-472-5790. That's 866-472-5790. Now back to Jordan. Welcome back to The Money Answer Show. This is Jordan Goodman, your host. My guest this hour is R.C. Peck. He's the founder of Fearless Wealth. You can find out more at his website, fearlesswealth.com. Welcome back to the show, R.C. Thanks. Good to be here. Why is money connected to people's identity? Oh, my gosh. I love this question. Um, So if we have not, (laughs) if I've not lost half of your listeners, I believe that people recreate their childhood trauma over and over, whether they do it daily, monthly, yearly, annually. Here's the interesting thing about money. It's the fastest way to recreate an unconscious trauma. If you were born into a family called just enough or born into a family called not enough or born into a family called enough, all right, but let's just say the the, the just enough. If you happen to get more than enough money in your life, your brain is going to say, I've never survived that before. Now, this is happening unconsciously, by the way, not consciously. No one does this consciously. Yeah. Right? And so what they'll do is they'll get a divorce or they'll, they'll lose all their money in a startup or they'll buy the rights to an oil well. Like They'll figure out a way to get rid of that stability so they can get back to that survivable, not enough or just enough state. And there's no faster way to recreate that trauma can't do it with weight. You can't do it with health. Those all have lag times of months, quarters, or years. But with money, you can lose it all in a moment and you get right back to that one-year-old, I don't know if I'm going to survive this experience that you you ended up surviving. You want what's familiar is basically what you're saying. Yeah. And and the weird way I would, I would agree with you in the weird way I would say, and I know I use weird languages, you want what you can survive. And so if you survived instability, your brain, without any training, is going to recreate instability throughout your whole life. Yeah. What is one of the biggest ideas that hurts people in investing? God, one of the biggest ideas. It's such a scary thing. When someone talks about investing and money, what it often does, it, it, it loads up madness, sadness, and scaredness. Right? So imagine there's a room in your house and on the door, it says, if you open this door, you're going to be mad, sad, and scared all at the same time. Okay. So what happens is people go, you know what? I'm just going to hire someone. 
I'm just, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna get someone so I never have to open that door, so I never have to deal with those big feelings. So I'm gonna go get myself a big box advisor, and he or she's gonna talk in a lot of jargon and confusing language and confuse me. But damn, I'm so glad they're there to solve the, you know, the, conf- the confusion that they created in my life. So I, I really think the biggest, the big, biggest problem is I can outsource this. I can outsource this, and I don't, I don't. You can outsource it after you get trained, yeah. uh, but I don't think you should outsource this any more than you outsource your marriage. It doesn't usually work when people outsource it. Then. But and, and they don't know. Like It's not their fault, right? Because there's not a third choice. I mean, I sound really weird and odd and unusual to a lot of people the way I talk, right? Because my whole thing is get trained first. And, yeah. then, and then be like, great, now that you're trained, you can decide. I mean, use any other metaphor you want. Um, you know, once you've looked at all these different exercises, figure out the one that works for you. Um, but I, I think the biggest thing is they don't really get what's going on, and they end up going to someone who uses an incredible amount of jargon and confusing language, and go, "Oh, okay, can you just, God, yeah, do it for me. just do it, just, for me. just, just, I'm good at what I do. You seem to be good at what you do. I don't really know what's going on." So the brain, the, the economists call it a heuristic. It's called a shortcut or a rule of thumb, and so one of the shortcuts in the world of investing is. I have no idea what to do, so I'm going to have to go with this thing called I trust and like you. And that's yep. what people do. Yeah. You're saying, though, that you think people can invest at a world-class level, but they often don't think it's possible. How can you give them a reason to say it is possible to invest at a world-class level on their own, not hiring an advisor? I mean, I run this experiment <laughs> every time someone does the training, even if they're septic- uh, skeptical it's here's something as you say imagine you're at the beach and your back is to the ocean and you're at a beach that has waves and your eyes are closed but you can hear the waves and maybe you can even feel them if they crash big enough so think about that person's experience with their eyes closed back to the water okay and I don't care how much they make or how good looking their spouse is or the you know, square footage of their house. That's going to be a very scary, unsettling experience for them. Okay. All I do in my training is turn them around, have them open their eyes, and look at the water. And when they do that, now the water is a metaphor for the stock market. And when they do that, they go, oh, my God, I'm okay. It's not that scary. It's, it's the fear of it that, that makes Yeah, people. well, I mean, because we've all done it. We've all been at a beach where we, our legs have been taken out by a wave that we didn't see because we we're chasing our kid or whatever. Like, it, it now creates stress in your system. Your adrenal glands are just on overdrive. Your amygdala is freaked out over every sound of crash, right? Yeah. And so it really is see, seeing it as believing it were – I, I, I know I'm using the metaphor, but where I turn them around, show them exactly how to look at a price chart, get rid of all the garbage on a price chart, and just show them, look, if you avoid the bad stuff, that I call them the Humpty Dumpty investments. If you avoid the Humpty Dumpty investments, even if they sound amazing, if they sound amazing, if you avoid those, literally like 99% of your problems go away because all you're left with is the stable ones. Yeah. Now, one thing people often should do, you say, is invest in their own company instead of investing in stocks. How should they make the decision of investing in, in effect, themselves versus the stock market? Yeah, so um, I work with a lot of entrepreneurs, and that often comes up, well, if I just buy more Facebook ads and I get X return on Facebook, then isn't that a better investment? And it's not an either or, right? It's a yes and, Um I don't know anyone who would not love the choice to not have to work, right? So that doesn't mean you don't want to work. That doesn't mean you don't like your job. But who wouldn't want the choice to not have to work if they didn't have to, regardless of their age? And so by doing both, of course, invest in your company and, of course, invest in your future. The the invest in your future is the got to figure out the money thing because there's going to be a point in time where maybe you want to take six months off. Right? Maybe you want to change direction of your company. Maybe you just want to stop working for a while and be a grandfather or a grandmother or a father. Or, do you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. it's, it's the choice to say, you know what? 
not this month, not this quarter, not this year. And that's what people want. People want the choice. And if they've only ever put money into make more money, like the income part of their life, they can't stop working. Yeah. So we have about two minutes left. Why don't you kind of summarize what a difference it would make in people's lives to follow everything we've talked about and what you have at fearlesswealth.com? The way it shows up the most is probably in people's sleep and people knowing they're going to be okay. And so I, th- I think maybe one of the questions is if people want control back over their money or their finances or their investing, it's going to come through opening your eyes or turning on your pattern recognition part of your brain towards your money. It's already there. You've just been taught to turn it off. Yeah. And, and the thing is, you don't have to trust it. Like once you turn around and see the ocean with the waves, whatever there, it's like, oh, I get it. It's instantaneous. And it's just because I am a dyslexic and I think in images and I train in images. And by the way, your brain and everyone's brain does really well with pattern recognition. That's why street signs on the highway are with images and not, you know, 35 word paragraphs. Yes. You see an, you see an image of falling rocks on a mountain go, oh, rocks might be falling. You don't yeah. read, you know, 50 words going, you're now on a mountain road and there's some instability ahead of you. It's just like, no, you get it. It's instant. You snap your finger, go, got it. Rocks yeah. might fall. Very good. Well, terrific. thanks so much. My guest this hour has been R.C. Peck. He's the founder of fearlesswealth.com. You can certainly go to that website, fearlesswealth.com, and see what he has to offer. You've given us a lot of really great ideas during this hour. Thanks so much, R.C. Thanks, Jordan. We'll be back next week with another edition of The Money Answer Show. Goodbye for now. Thank you for joining Jordan Goodman and The Money Answer Show. If you have a question for Jordan, please visit his website at www.moneyanswers.com. And be sure to tune in every Monday at 12 p.m. Pacific Standard Time right here on Voice America Business. See you next week.